Newt Rockne made Notre Dame's football teams the most famous and most feared in the country. He made Notre Dame a great and prosperous university. But for himself, he asked little. When Rockne's chance came to profit financially, fate intervened. The Rockne story begins in Chicago 50 years ago. A young immigrant from Norway, you played football on the open lots of the city during your school days. Your family was far from wealthy. You worked in the Chicago post office to earn money to go to college. A photo album of those days shows Notre Dame, your alma mater, then a known little school at South Bend. You chose Notre Dame because it was inexpensive. In 1913, you were a star of the track team and captain of the football team that defeated mighty West Point. Graduating, you became an instructor of chemistry at the school. Also a part-time job as assistant football coach. You liked coaching. More important, you were newly married, needed the extra money. 1918, head coach now, but was there a future in football? Train those boys well, your job depends on them. No fumbling, no money for new equipment. Use what you have carefully. Teach your men to make every move count, to tackle hard and true. Drill your team in precision. Your theory, if every man does his job, every play should go for a touchdown. Be ever on the alert for the star around whom to build your team. You found the star wanted. Found him in George Gipp. He sparked your early teams to an amazing record of victories. Untied and undefeated in 1919. Untried and undefeated in 1920. Then a tragedy. Newt Rockne grieved for Gip. Then he turned to the task of rebuilding his team. Quarterback Harry Stuhldreher was a question mark. Fullback Elmer Layden couldn't keep away from tacklers. Right halfback Jim Crowley was a fumbler. Don Miller, left halfback, seemed bored by the game. Yet as the four horsemen, they were destined to make history. Three, nine victories and one loss. In 1924, untied and undefeated, they became front page news, nicknamed the Wandering Irish and Rockney's Ramblers. The climax, an invitation to play against Leland Stanford in the Rose Bowl. It was Notre Dame's first trip to the West Coast. The team was weary, Stanford was fresh and strong. On the bench, Rockney watched anxiously, but he need not have worried. Notre Dame won the game decisively. Rockne was welcomed back to South Bend with a victory parade. He was now one of the great coaches of his time. He had brought Notre Dame from obscurity to fame. In the winter of 1925, he went to New York City. Columbia University was interested. Rockne wasn't earning much at Notre Dame. Would he consider a change? That winter, the newspapers stated, was it true? Was Rockne's long association with Notre Dame ended? It was big news indeed. Had Newt Rockne agreed to coach Columbia? We'll never know. When Rockne returned to the Notre Dame campus, he denied it. When I quit coaching Notre Dame, I'm through with football. 1928, a new season with new faces and problems. The mighty four horsemen were gone. That season was the most disastrous of Rockney's career. Could this team defeat West Point, Rockney's traditional foe? It didn't seem likely. But if they could, other losses would be forgiven. 80,000 spectators crowded Yankee Stadium that year to see Notre Dame in action against West Point, the big game of the year. The boys from Notre Dame were the underdogs, fighting with their backs to the wall. Army's great backfield tore the Irish line to shreds. 
The boys from South Bend fought back as best they could during the first half, trying to hold down the score, but West Point seemed destined for victory. On the bench, Newt Rockne suffered with his players as they were driven over the field. The spectators waited for the Army triumph that seemed sure as the first half ended. The Notre Dame team's dressing room. Inside, Newt Rockne spoke quietly to his players. He told them of the request George Gipp had made eight years before on his deathbed. When the brakes are hurting the boys, Gipp had said, tell them to go out there and win one for the Gipper. This was it, Rockney added, the game to win for George Gipp. Back on the playing field went the Irish. The crowd expected a beaten team, but from the first kickoff, the Irish played like men inspired. Rockney's words had fired his men. Suddenly, this team was equal to Notre Dame's best. A series of slashing plays brought them close to the Army goalposts, then over to score the tying touchdown. The cadets were still confident. Now Rockney made his bid for victory. A forward pass to a lad named O'Brien who had been sent in for this one play. O'Brien carried the ball over the goal line. A game won for the Gipper. With the end of the season, Rockney defended football against its critics on lecture platforms. Some folks seem to think that because 11 boys are keen, smart, and alert on the football field, they must be dull and stupid in the classroom. And likewise, that if a boy is dull and stupid in the class, or uh, smart in the classroom, why, uh, that uh, he'll be dull on the football field. But there's nothing to indicate that. Because of the previous season, you had your own critics, but you predicted that next year's team would equal the best. You were a good prophet, as usual, in 1929, the Irish traveled far. It was Notre Dame's greatest team of all time. Its stars included John Law, fullback Marty Brill, quarterback Frank Corridio. Unbeaten in 17 games, that team traveled west in 1930 to meet a strong opponent, the Trojans of Southern California. 90,000 Californians jammed the stadium that day. The Trojans were the greatest scoring team ever developed on the West Coast. The fans expected Notre Dame to be toppled from the unbeaten list. They saw precisely the reverse. Although weary from their long journey, the Irish put on one of their greatest displays of aggressive football, slashing the Trojans to ribbons. The crowd was jolted. But more and worse was to come. With dazzling speed and team play, Notre Dame ripped off touchdown after touchdown. The final score, Notre Dame 27, Southern California nothing. It was Newt Rockney's proudest moment. Hailed as the outstanding team of all football history, the Irish returned to a jubilant victory celebration at South Bend. But you didn't want your men to be dazzled by victory. After the celebration, some words of advice. And it's up to you fellows to get back in there and double up in your time and your classes so that you'll pass your semester examination. You were thinking of the future of those boys and of your own as well. A few weeks later, you boarded an airplane bound for Hollywood. You had an offer to make several sports movies at a large salary. You had never earned much money. Here was the chance to provide financial security for your family. You flew west. Over Kansas, the plane vanished. It was found on a Kansas hillside, a mass of wreckage. In the debris was the body of Newt Rockne. He had gone in search of security and found death. They brought him home to South Bend, home to a grief-stricken family, stunned by the sudden disaster home to a city plunged into mourning by the passing of its most famous citizen. Sorrowfully, they carried him from his home to the Sacred Heart Church on the Notre Dame campus. Newt Rockne's pallbearers were six of the boys he had led to victory on the gridiron in years past. Corridio, Schwartz, Conley, Brill, Yar, and Mullins. They buried Newt Rockne on the campus grounds. He would have wanted it that way, 
For hadn't his genius made Notre Dame great, and hadn't he become great in the process? In the deepest sense of the words, he was the rock of Notre Dame.